praise the Lord. God bless you. Let's just stand for the reading of the word. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. One verse, verse number 14. So happy that I have the keyboard so you can switch to the screen. So I'm asking you to, to use the Bible. The Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 14. It says here, let's read together. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because thus judge, sorry, because we thus judge, that if one die for all, then we're all dead. Praise the Lord. Let's say the love of God constraineth us. That's the thought I want to leave with you tonight. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. If you do a lot of study, it's not good just to just listen to the word and leave it there. Go home, check the verse, search it, study it. So what does the word constrain mean? If we look at the word constrain, the love of God controls us. It keeps us in check. It directs our life, our lives, all because of the love of God. I taught a series of at, at, at my church before on relationship. It's a five-part series, and uh, the part concerning loving God was about three parts. So I'm just going to give you just one part of that, and hope that it will edify your life and your walk tonight. So. We, we talk about the essential of relationships, so I'll just pop them all on the screen for you to see. How we relate to ourself, oneself, how you relate to your personal life. If you don't have a healthy self, you can't help anybody else. If you're hurting, if you're going through trauma, if you're going through difficulty, you cannot help anybody else. As a matter of fact, um, um, some people, uh, when they're getting married, they go to their pastor, or if you go to pastoral counseling before you, you get married. Some people don't, and some people may have. They will tell you if you have a particular trauma in your body, or in your life, or in your early life, that you're being abused, or somebody taking advantage of you, somewhere or the other, you have to get that section of your life healed first before you actually go into the marriage. Because if you go into the marriage with that unhealed self, it will actually hurt your marriage. So it is if other people are suffering from personal issues and you are trying to help others while you're suffering through those personal issues, you're not going to be effective. You must first take care of yourself in the sense of healing your mind, have a healthy body, have a healthy self, so that you're able to minister to somebody else. And when you recover, then you're in a position to help and minister to somebody else. That's what it means to relate to oneself. Next one is how we relate in crisis. As we said this morning, crisis defines us. And it tells us where we're at and what we do and how we can get along in life and how we can recover in life. A lot of people have gone through a lot of crises and because they are not recovered, whenever things come in their life, they're always lashing out. They're always lashing out. And if when until the Lord come, if you're not caught in the right state, state of mind, state of your spiritual soul and state of consciousness, Anger will control you, envy will control you, bitterness will control you, and then the love of God will not be resident in your life. So now we have to relate successfully when we face crises. Now the next thing we have to do is learn to lead ourselves. A lot of people lead a lot of other folks, and they can tell them what to do and what not to do, but when it comes to leading themselves, they cannot lead themselves. And why people, some people cannot lead themselves? 
As soon as they get the position of power, they start to abuse other people because they have not learned to lead themselves. First of all, you've got to be able to lead yourself before you can lead anybody else. For example, you can be teaching people not to lie when you are lying. You can be teaching people to live a moral life when you are living an immoral life. So it's essential for you to lead first, lead ourselves. And all of those are just one hour study. So just recapture, cabin, recapture. Now, number four is how we relate to others. The Bible said we should love our neighbors as thyself. So the first criteria is to love your neighbor. But before you can get to your neighbor, you gotta first love yourself. You know that some people don't love themselves? Some people are looking right now for a bridge to jump off. Because they have not developed a love and a care for themselves. This kind of love is not selfish love. That is just me, myself, and I and nobody else. This is a love that is a responsibility to the commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. So you cannot be a self-abuser. You cannot be a self-mutilator. You cannot be a self-denier. You've got to relate to yourself. The last one here, which is the most important one, is how we relate to God. Everything that from number one to four depends on how we all relate to God. If we don't have a successful relationship with God, there's a high probability that you may not have a successful relationship with anybody else because your relationship with God is key. So relationship is essential. So we, have, we are just covering part one. So we did knowing God, loving God, serving God. So I'm just doing not part one. There are at least three ways to test a personal love. If you say you love God, your love will be tested. If you say you love somebody, your love will be tested. Some people have relationship problems and they don't know if the person is cheating on them, so they hire, uh, what do you call that, uh, a private investigator to check them out. And if you come home and lie, the private investigator has the video. Your love will be tested. Now, are you worthy of love? Some people love others so much that the only thing left for them to do is give love. Because they, they love the person so much and the person still turn around and abuse them. Are you worthy of love? For you to be worthy of love, you gotta understand God's love and apply it to our lives. And when I say you, remember I'm talking about me too, and that's just preaching to you, I'm talking about me too. So first of all, your love will be compared, your love will be analyzed, and your love will be verified. If you say you love, and some people you know, some people are all talk, just all talk. And that's why some people get caught up um, with, with, with individuals because they talk so much and convince them that, oh, I'm going to take care of you for the rest of your life. And girl, by the time you reach 50, he's gone because his love was not verified. So your love for God also now will be compared your love will be analyzed and your love will be verified. And this is based on the test that happens in your personal life. This is just your personal walk. Your love will be compared, your love will be analyzed, and your love will be verified. So your love compared. The, uh, the scripture is there right on the screen, so you just write it down. First, John chapter 21 and verse 15. Your love compared for service. Jesus says, so when they had died, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? So if your love is compared to something else, that challenges your love. Jesus knows all things. 
Do you agree with that? Yes. So why did he ask in Simon this question? For Simon to know for himself. There's a, some things that you don't really know yet for sure. You have to be tested and verified in God's presence. And you know, some people say, Pastor, I'm going to help you pick the whole church. And when it's 9 o'clock Monday morning, I'm going to come down, I'm going to get all the brush, and I'm going to paint the whole church. When you come past that, everything is going to be nice and shiny. Pastor, come at 12 o'clock, and you don't even show up. You come next day, nothing is painted. The feeling God. With God, love is a principle. Write that down. With God, love is a principle. And sometimes with man, love is a feeling or an emotion. We want to go by God's love. The love that's a principle. So God loves you when you're no good. And when you're still no good, he still loves you. God loves you when you sin against him. But when you repent, he still loves you. God loves you when you're up. God loves you when you're down. Your love with God should be also a principle. So John says that the, the, the writer said in first in John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had died, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? So your love for Christ will be compared with all the things of the world. So the, the, the devil take up Jesus up on the mountain and show him all the things that look so glistening and gold. You're going to see something in your life, at some point in your life, that will challenge your love for God. And you have to stand up and say, for God I live, and for God I die. And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. First John chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is, this is the book. The love of God is not in you if you are a lover of the world. Your love compared. Your love, number two, is analyzed. You say you love God, it's going to come to a place of analysis or scrutiny. So, Jesus asked him the second time, he said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. The first one was feed my lambs, feed the little one, feed the children. The second now feed the others, feed the bigger one, feed the bigger ones. Because love is universal from small to young to whatever age. In your life, when you're small in the Lord, you should still love God. When you think you are reach your plateau in God, you should still love God. The love of God controls your life, our lives. First Corinthians 13, verse 2. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountain but have not love, I am something. Thank you. Somebody corrected me. I am nothing. A lot of people said, I love you, 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 Sister Henry, I love you, Brother Martin, I love you, Pastor, I love you, Brother Patrick, I love you. But when the rubber hit the roads, where does that mean spirit come from? I love you with the love of the Lord. Remember, love is a principle. Anybody know what's a principle? A principle is something that cannot be broken. It's, it's like a law. Uh, you've been to, to school to take uh, physics and math, and they teach you about the, the force of gravity, 9.8 meters per second. And if you jump from off of there, you know you're going to drop to the floor. If you go up further, you jump, you're going to drop and, and break like a rotten egg. Because the force of gravity, it doesn't care what you throw out the window, it's going to fall. It's a principle. So God's love is a principle. He loved you when you not, were not worthy of his love. 
So now that he come, you come to Christ, why would you allow the, allow the devil to tell you that God doesn't love me anymore? What kind of business is that? God's love is a principle. And you can abide by his love and abide in his love. And his love control you. And his love demands that you walk a certain path. So your love will be analyzed. Number three, your love will be verified. John chapter 21 verse 16. He said to him again the second time. Uh, this this should, should be the third time. Uh, verse 17 maybe I should, I should read. He second said unto him the third time. But I put that scripture there. And he said, feed my sheep. So I'm going to read Chapter 21, because I make a typo there. Chapter 21. I jump over to chapter 21. Verse. Just be patient with me. I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. I'm there. Verse 17. So I put 16 twice. I wanted to put 17, but this is the third time. He said unto him the third time. John chapter 21, verse 17. The other about me turned here. So Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Guess what Peter did? Guess what Peter did? Peter was upset, angry, grieved. Peter said, being grieved, because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? He said unto the Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest, I love thee. And he said unto him, double verified, feed my sheep. So the, when Jesus asked this question, it was not for Jesus to know, but for Peter to apply his lives, his life to the principle of God. When God asks your question, when God asks Adam, Adam, where are you now? You think God will know where Adam was? It's for Adam to step forward and say, Oh God, I have stepped away from your love. Please forgive me. But Adam blamed the woman. And then the woman blamed the serpent. And actually Adam indirectly blamed God because he said, The woman you gave me. When God asks your question, is to make an adjustment in your life so that you can draw closer to God. It's not for God to find out. It's for Him. He's giving you a chance to correct yourself, to clean up, to get ready, to prepare your heart. That's why He asks questions. After these things, God tested Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and He said, here am I. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, who thou lovest in rub it in. Whatever you love will be tested. Whatever you love will be challenged. And there's some things that we love so much. That we can't lead them to serve God. If you can't lead them to serve God, you're saying they are better than God. Your love will be tested. Every temptation that you face out there before you come to Christ, when you come to Christ and living for Him and serving Him and loving Him and praising Him, one day the devil's going to come around from out of nowhere. You're going to say, Where did this smoking spirit come from? I thought I dropped smoking. Why am I being tempted with smoking? Why am I being tempted with more girls and more men? Why am I being tempted to go back to the wrong bar? Why am I being tempted? Because you're only tested in the areas of the things that you love. That's right. All right, that's right. So when you come to love God, you should love Him with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and spirit. And in that area too, you're going to be tested as well. Because the enemy is going to after you day after day to say, do you really love God? And he said, take your son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering. 
of one of, of one of the Mount Road signs shall tell you. Did God know what Abraham would do? God knew what Abraham would do. But Abraham didn't know altogether what he may do. He just proved, God just have to prove him. Your love will be tested. Your love will be verified. Your love will be analyzed. Your love will be proven. Your love will be scrutinized. Some things are just big, big talk. But when rubber hits the road, there it is. The Bible, God proved his love for us when he said, down from his glory, every living story, my God and Savior came, Jesus was his name, born in a manger, to his own stranger, a man of sorrow, tears, and agony. Oh, how I love him. Oh, how I adore him. My breath, my sunshine, my all in all, the great creator became my Savior and all God's fullness dwelt in him. Your love will be tested. Jesus' love for us was proven on the cross. He died. He died. So why should your love be tested? The Messiah has an adventure against sin. So who is it who coming from Eden with crimson garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I that speak it in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel wet red and your garments like that who tread the wine press? I have trodden the wine press alone, and from the people no one was with me. I trod them in my anger, trampled them in my wrath. Their life blood splattered on my garment. And stay in all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. And the year of redemption had come. Jesus do all of this. Try the white person alone to save you. And to bring you. And to pull you in by his love. How can you not love him with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength? I looked and there was no one to help. I was appalled, I wondered, and there was no one to uphold. My own harm brought salvation, and my wrath upheld me. Jesus is the avenger against sin. There's one thing I see in Pentecost that surprises me. A lot of people rejoice when they get a new car. They rejoice when they're married to the new wife. They rejoice when they get the new building. They rejoice when they get the new mortgage. They rejoice when they get the new jobs. But I don't see a lot of people rejoice when they have their sins washed away. It seems that they forget about that day that their sin was washed away and it was removed as far as the east is from the rest. And if you can't rejoice about anything, rejoice that your sin has been forgiven. As far as your east is from the west, if when you come into the courts and anything is holding you down and holding you back, just remember the day where we brought you out of the mire clay and brought you out of sin. If you remember that day, you have a right to rejoice and it's enough to encourage your heart. Because he saved me. What kind of love is this? This is a special kind of love. Behold, what manner of love is this? That the Father has bestowed upon us, granted to us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world know him not because he knew, because the world know us not because he knew him not. Beloved, what? Now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Jesus came and died on the cross for one purpose. For you to be like him. He loves you. He wants you to grow in 
in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a special kind of love. And every man that hath this hope in him, purify himself as he is pure. So if the love of God is in your heart, you're not going to want to turn away from the things of God and turn away from the teaching of God and turn away from the word of God and turn away from the scripture. You're going to want to draw close to the Lord and create in me a clean heart of God and renew within me a right spirit because I have felt your love. I want to purify my heart. This love is also universal. Yeah. It's for everybody. It's for the little ones. It's for the big ones. It's for those who are downtrodden. It's for the sinner on the street that need God. It's for everybody. This love is universal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I hear you teaching around going on, on Pentecost that says God only loves some people. And if you are not the elect, you are not one of God's children. Because God only come to save the elect. And then he said, by grace you are saved. And then you don't have nothing to do with it. We understand that by grace we are saved. But we also understand that we have to repent. We have to live for God. We have to come and come to the altar. And say, God, come into my heart. Some people define that as works. That's not works. That's a response to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he speaks to your heart, you respond. So the love of God controls you. The love of God constrains you. The love of God directs you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this doctrine say, you know what? According to Calvin, the Calvinist doctrine says, God designed some people to go to hell and there's nothing they can do about it. They're going to go to hell no matter how much they got baptized, no matter how much they come to the altar, no matter how much they repent, you were designed to go to hell. That's a damnable doctrine. That's an evil that that doctrine is against scripture. That's a damnable doctrine. And a lot of people pick that up in their cars. You go ahead and read, right? <laughs> the Bible says in the book of Peter, it is the will of God that no one perish. So how who are you going to believe? Calvin or Jesus? Calvin or Peter? He said it's the will of God that no one perish. What happened is because you're not responding to the gospel. Amen. When you respond to his love, his love controls you. Amen. But you can't reject his love. He came to give everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The world, the world, everybody in the world that respond to this love will be saved. But if you don't respond, and if you reject him, and if you backslide, and if you turn around, and if you turn away from God, you will not be saved. But you got to respond to his love. When you respond to God's love, you will be saved. God's love is favorable love. For, scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man will one even dare to die. But God commended his love or uh, introduced his love favorable with grace and mercy and a night of favor. And introduced his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Some of you mothers, if you know that the son is going to turn out to be a lawyer, you go to the adoption service, your husband and wife, and you want to adopt somebody, you know he's going to turn out to be a lawyer, he's going to turn out to be a doctor, he's going to turn out to be a school teacher, he's going to be a responsible somebody, he's going to be a member of parliament. You're going to say, yes, I'll adopt that one. I'll adopt that one. I'll adopt that one. Because you have some insight that they're going to turn out too well. 
But look who Jesus took. He took the one that was deep in sin. He took the one that was far from the peaceful shore. He took the one that was cursing his name. He took the one that was a nobody. You see, God called you while you're in sin. But when you come out of sin, he transformed the life. Because the Bible let us know, hallelujah, for God so loved the world that he gave. It's only begotten son. God's love, whosoever, whosoever, that's the priest. When all the dust is settled, and somebody rub you the wrong way and get on your last nerve, as we said this morning, and you want to commit suicide, don't let it cross your mind. God's love is greater than what anybody else can do to you or for you or against you. God's love is superior. Superior. God commended his love towards us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Such love, thank you. Such wondrous love that God could love a sinner such as I was. Some of us forget that we were sinners, you know. Some of us forget that we were sinners. You need to become mature spiritually overnight. It takes a growth, a growth process. And in the growth process, you became perfect. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So his love also, number D, is enduring love. You can't outrun God. You can't do anything that God does stop loving you. It's a plan of the devil for you to think that uh, God's love is enduring. Love is patient and kind. Love that, that envy and boast. It is not arrogant. If you do something for me, you don't have to go and tell everybody, oh, I have brother this that because I found him walking down the street and he didn't have no money. So you have to propagate it to everybody you meet. That's not love. That's show off. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Love does not boast. Love is not ignorant or arrogant. Are rude. You know, some people come and they're just rude. They're just, they're just rude. And they think, I just I, I have to tell you a piece of my mind because this is how I feel. There are things that has to be done in respect. And the Bible said, decent and in the honor. If you really love, you're not rude. That's right. That's right. You be rude. This is the English Standard Version. It's not rude. It's not, it's not the Bible said puffed up, the king says. Puffed up. You know some people are so puffed up. If you stick a pin, they'll blow up in your face. They will puff in man. The love of God must control you. It controls you, constrains you. It does not insist on its own way. It's my way or the highway. You can't say that. You're going to say it's God's way. It's God's way or nobody else's way. You can't have that spirit. It is not irritable and resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. If somebody fall away and fall into sin, you will say, yes, I know that's going to happen to him. You rejoice in. No, you should be mourning. You should be crying. You should be begging God to have mercy. It does not rejoice in what I'm doing. Love restores. Love strengthens. Love keeps. Because when we look at our hand, there's nobody here that has been made to the cross for anybody else. Love be all things. Love believes all things. Hope all things. And endure. This is the tough one. <laughs> endure all things. Great love. I'll tell you before I say that, and do all things. Tell your story that Bishop Ricky told us in the Bible study. He said, 
this gentleman who was now a bishop his wife goes to church and over the years she was going to church and while she was going to church he, he come home she prepare his food she don't like what it look he doesn't like what it looks like he throw it to the sink and she had to go and cook she's ready her clothes is on she make a little nice breakfast for him and she's heading out to church and she's heading out to church and for some reason, fine, some reason he doesn't like the breakfast, he throws it in the garbage. And she has to pause, but it takes a lot of love to do. You know, some of them, they will never do the truck up at the end. And they pop up at the end. But she, 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 she went in her humility, and she went back to the kitchen and making breakfast. And then she goes to church. We slate, but she did. And this goes on for a long time. Because she he wanted to get on her last nerve to stop going to church, stop serving God. And one day after he was along this one day his heart got so convicted, he came to church with her. And he said to himself, if there is a God that this lady loves so much that can cause her to be in control of her spirit, I want to meet this God. And you know he came to church and he met God. And God dealt with him. And now he became eventually a bishop. So the love of God endures a lot. It endures all things. There's some things you can handle that I can't handle. And there's something that I may be able to handle that you can't handle. God knows what you're able to deal with. Just love him with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your body, and your strength. God love is great. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, where he loved us. Even when we were dead in sin, our quickness together in Christ. By grace you are saved. We are saved by the unmerited favor of God. Salvation is a free gift. And God has raised us up together and made us to sit in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus because of his love. Heaven is a relationship built based on God's love. God's love and the love of Christ Jesus. Let me just rush on. The Bible said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. For you. Why? And I go and prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Heaven is a relationship goal. Do you know that today in Canada, there's a lot of people that don't want to go to their own house because the house is like a mad house. Poor, broken relationship destroy loves. When you are in love, there is no fear because perfect love passes out all fear. Heaven is a relationship goal. The Bible said, O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever endure the saints of angel song. Let that be your song, the love of God. The Bible said we are to love God's word. We are to love God's precept. We have to love God's double statutes. We have to love God's law. We have to love God's commandment. We have to love God's judgment. We have to love the appearing. You should love the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be looking forward to His coming. You should love His name. We should love His ways. We should love His salvation. We should love with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our understanding, with all our might, with all our mind, and with all our strength. Love is a principle that cannot be destroyed. 
love the truth and we are to love his truth. In God's love there is no fear. Love comfort. Love there is peace. Love there is strength. In love there is joy. In love there is power. In love there is no fear. In God's love there is perfection. When you are afraid to go into the presence of God, there's something wrong. Sin destroy God's love. When sin it takes a, you know, I, 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 I use the wrong phrase there. Sin can't destroy God's love, but sin breaks a relationship where the love of God flows. And if you don't feel uncomfortable when you sin, maybe you don't have the love of God in your heart. Check it! Check it. Amen. If there's, is there someone who is married and run around with 10 women, 15 women, one woman outside, and they don't feel bad when they come home? There is no love. Love at home is dead. Amen. But God's love cannot die. Amen. God's love is perfect love. God's love is wonderful love. God's love is great love. God's love is strong love. God's love is a powerful love. God's love gives comfort and peace. God's love. Your love will be tested and your love for God will be tested by other things. To keep the covenant and mercy, the Bible says, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than other people, for they were, for you were fewer than all other people. God didn't pick you because you were so lovely, nice and kind. What did God pick you? God chose you because he loved you. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, and the Lord brought you with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage for the hand of Pharaoh the king, from the hand of Pharaoh the king, because he loved you. Because he loved you, no care for the Lord thy God is God. He's faithful God. He keepeth the covenant of mercy with them that love him and keep his commandment to a thousand generation. I can't understand why some people say, Oh God, pray for me. Bless me, God. Bless me, God. Bless me with this God. Bless me with that God. I want your blessing. I want you to be upon me with your blessing. Bless me. But you don't have a desire to love God. A lot of people just want the benefits, but they don't want God's love. They don't want to reciprocate His love. They don't want to commit to His love. Love is a sacrifice. You have to get rid of some things. You gotta throw things aside and focus on God's love. When anything interfere with God's love, it spoils relationship with God. Lord, I want to keep your commandments and I want to love you. Help me, Jesus. The Bible says that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that he be rooted and grounded where? In love. How should you be rooted and grounded? Be rooted and grounded in the love of God. No matter what the devil may tempt you with, be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Because the love of God constrained me. Maybe may be able now to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. God's love is powerful. It's not just an emotion and a feeling. God's love makes you disciplined. God's love makes you respectful. God's love makes you want to sacrifice. God's love makes you want to commit to things that concern God. God's love is the greatest thing. There are four areas, as before we close. There are four areas where your love will be tested. I talk about the testing of your love. There are four areas. Write these four areas down. Area number one. Your love will be tested in the pit. 
Somebody that cares about you is going to lie on you. Somebody that you thought needs your help is going to turn around and backbite you and betray you. And you're going to have to turn around and love them. They're going to throw you, so to speak, in the pit. There's another area you're going to be tested in. Your love will be tested in the area of your passions. What do you really like? What would you give up for God? What would you do so that you violate the principle of God's love? The things that you like, if the things that you like are stronger than your love for God, the things that you like is going to take you away from God. You're going to be tested in your passion. What makes you angry? What makes you want to have a illicit relationship? You have to be tested in those. The next one here is, you're going to be tested in the prison. Something is going to hold you back, hold you down. And you're not, you're, instead of you submitting, you're going to be able to want to rise up in anger and bitterness and resentment. It's going to be, so to speak, like a prison. Like a prison. And you're going to see what happened. Joseph was tested in all these points. He was thrown in the pit. Potiphar's wife lied on him and said, come and lie with me. And he ran. He was tested in his passion. And he was thrown in prison. He was tested in prison. As a child of God, you will be tested in the pit. You will be tested on your passions. And you will be tested in prison. And there is one more test you got to find. You will be tested in the palace. For peace. You will be tested. You know there are some people you can't promote. The moment you promote them, all of a sudden they start to abuse the workers because power fly up in their head. They can't manage it. They are rich. They have arrived. And now they start to abuse others because they reach an, a, 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 an elevation of power. Your love for God will be tested in all these four areas. You're going to be tested in the pit when everybody talk about you, talk against you. You're going to be tested by your passion when the things that you want to do or feel like doing and the flesh is covering you and coming down upon you with all the strength of hell. You're going to say, God! And I'm not going to sin against you and do this wicked act. In the name of Jesus, I will overcome. Amen. You're going to be tested in the prison. And in the prison, people are going to mock you. Hey, what are you doing here, man? What, 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 what did you do now? You're going to be tested in the prison. You're going to be tested and constrained in, so to speak, in a prison atmosphere. But it's in the prison where you get your dreams. It's in the prison where you get the interpretation. Thank you, sister. It's in the prison where God call you up and get you in the palace. And when you get to the palace, you forget about the pit. You forget about the passions. You forget about prison. Because the pit, the passion of the prison was to get you to the palace. And based on how you react, based on how what happened in your life, you may never get to the palace if you have the wrong attitude concerning the constraining power of the love of God in any of these situations you will never get to the palace and when you get to the palace, some people say yes, these 12 boys these little boys ah, I got them where I want them now they abuse me, they throw me in the pit, they cause me to build Let somebody else do it, but you can't do it. Because the love of God constrains you. As I come close to the close of this, let's just finish. I'm going to talk about misplaced love. I'm just going to read them. Misplaced love is loving the benefits more than the supplier. You love all the blessings, God bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, but you don't love God. 
We love the benefits more than the supplier. God is the supplier of the benefits. Loving the resources more than the source. Singing for the audience instead of for God. Performing for others instead of for God. God is not interested in your song. He is interested in your love. When we love, when, when love is consummated in the heart, we can sin when we truly have the love of God. It's in the heart. This melody of love divine, it's in the heart. Because I am His and He is mine. It's in my heart. How can I help? But sin and self is in my heart. It's in my heart. That's where it needs to be. In your heart. When we are more concerned about how people receive us instead of how God receives us, we have misplaced love. Love is, love for God is reflected in our time and how and where we spend our time. Where do you spend your time during the week? It's a reflection of your love. Our love is shown by what we value most. If our experience never mold us to serve God, we are just waiting for a spiritual handout. When you go through the body, you become stronger. When you go through the difficult times, you become stronger. If you're not becoming stronger, you're just waiting for a spiritual handout. Give me God, give me God, give me God, give me God. Where is your love that is going to be going through your experience so that you can have a real testimony? What, whatever we love more than God is an idol. Whatever we, whatever we value more than God is an idol. Worship begins with priorities. Our priorities direct our love. A true worshiper, even worship in pain. If you have not really learned to worship in pain yet, you are not a true worshiper. A true worshiper, even worship when things are hard. Your experience introduces you to a different way to praise God and to worship. That's why it says, I have a testimony. You cannot worship God beyond how much you love God. Somebody said, I worship him, I worship him, I worship him. But you go out and you start serving devils. You cannot worship God more than how much you love God. Your worship is parallel to your love of God. Your worship for God is proportionally relationship related to your love for God. Job worship. Remember Job? Remember Job? Hallelujah. Remember Job? Everybody remember Job? Job worship through his experience. Anybody have a Job experience? Oh Lord, help us all. Help us all. I'm just going to close off now. Then Job arose and licked his mantle and shaved his head and fell upon the ground and worshiped. Hallelujah. In the midst of it all. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Oh God, do you only want God to give? Sometimes God takes away, and you still got to love Him. Your love will be tested. In all this, in all this, in all this. In all this, in all this, in all this, in all this, Job sin not, nor charge God foolish. Oh Lord, help us all. Help us all, Lord. Help us all, help us all. Help us all, Lord, help us all. Help us, dear Lord, that our love will be proven for thee. We will draw closer to you. We will worship you with all our heart. We will bless you with all our soul. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice.
to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my King. In what you hear, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in you.